Good morning and welcome to Living Beyond Your Crisis. And uh, of course, this is applicable not just to the time that we're in a coronavirus, but it's also applicable to all of the crisis of life. And none of us are uh, going to miss life. None get out of life unscarred. Life has difficulty. Life is complicated. And, um, and so all of us are going to have the crisis or the multiple of that, the crises of life, whatever they look like, and each of those are, are different for, for every one of us. Uh, getting uh, just a little bit of a reminder in place of what we're trying to do, number one, I'm always going to use Scripture in context. That means it's, uh, if you read everything around it, that uh, the verse meaning does not change whatsoever, and that's an important part of studying and also teaching the Bible one writer said that a text without context is a pretext. In other words, you can take the Bible and pretty well make it say whatever you want to say. Uh, the second thing is questions are welcome. Third is that I obviously do not know everything there is about the Bible. Uh, I do welcome questions. I'm very comfortable saying I don't know. Um, for those who have joined already, I hope that you're having a great Monday. It is a cool spring day in the Ozarks, and uh, in, uh, I was just noticing that there were weather predictions for south of us that there would be a bit of snow tonight, but um, again, the changeable weather uh, of our part of the country. I uh, hope each of you had a good Easter. In our house, it was very different. No grandkids, no children, uh, the two of us, and, um, and very simple and quiet. Uh, no normal Sunday service, and I'm sure it was very different for many of you. Um, please share our post uh, out to others, and uh, if you want to start a watch party, uh, you can invite those who are your friends. It's very easy to do this. Uh, you just click the button for a watch party, and then you you invite uh, any of your friends, and of course our our folks and those who live in this part of the country, in the Ozarks. Good to see uh, several who are from beyond here. It's good to see uh, Lacey. I hope things are well with you and the new addition that's headed your way and uh, a number of other people who are friends and acquaintances. Uh, it's good to see Susie, who is a first cousin, lives in Kentucky. Let's get into this today. And I've already laid the foundation uh, in place and uh, given you kind of what I try to do with all of this. Um, in our last session, we began talking about, or we continued talking about the Holy Ghost, and that the Holy Ghost, in the way we're conversing about it, uh, we distinguish between the Holy Ghost prior to the New Testament church and the Holy Ghost since the inception of the church, and uh, that the Holy Ghost is a major player. Holy Spirit is, is, means exactly the same thing that uh, this is a major player in the book of Acts, that uh, there are people who have said that the Acts of the Apostles should really have been better named the Acts of the Holy Spirit because in every single chapter, the Holy Ghost is a major player. The word Holy Spirit means set apart and then pneuma, which in certain contexts is translated as wind, is translated within the scripture as spirit. So. It is this set-apart spirit. God is holy before any of humanity is holy. That means he is a set-apart God. There is no God like him. That statement is affirmed throughout the scripture. There is none like him. So when we begin to talk about the Holy Ghost, when we begin to talk about the Spirit of God in the New Testament church, what are we talking about? Number one, and we addressed this earlier, we're talking about the Spirit of Christ. So when a person has the Holy Ghost, they have the Spirit of Christ in them. When I was uh, just a youngster and my grandfather preached on a Sunday night in Tioga and I received the Holy Ghost, I had the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God come into me. Okay, the second thing we've talked about is that the Holy Ghost is a new birth, that this is a new beginning, that Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus explained to him, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So 
to have the Holy Ghost is a new beginning in our life. It is a new start, and it gives us entrance into the kingdom of God. The Holy Ghost in Ephesians is likened to a seal. It's that imprint that uh, a purchasing farmer pressed into grain that indicated to all other potential purchasers that this has been sold. This belongs to uh, Carlton Kuhn. His stamp has been put into that seal. It is his. He's paid the price for it. So the Holy Ghost in Ephesians is twice called the seal. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Ghost marks you as belonging to God. It's not just that we have this as the seal, but we also have the Holy Ghost as the earnest. Again, this is from Ephesians. It is the earnest of our inheritance. It is the beginning. It's the down payment. It's the start of what we're going to inherit in eternal life, okay? And then the Holy Ghost is a spirit of adoption. We have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. What is the spirit that we receive? We receive the Holy Ghost, and this is borne out in the book of Romans and also addressed in the book of Galatians. If you have any questions about any of that, please feel free to give me a call or, or to uh, send a message below if you'd like a copy of my notes where that you can teach your children while this is going on uh, all you have to do is ask, and I'll be glad to send these to you. And uh, I've certainly made a lot of additions since I've been teaching here. Now, let's move into new material. In Luke chapter 24, and verse 49, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high, until you be saturated until you be filled with power from on high. Okay, so he is talking about the promise of the Father. Now, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we get probably a better explanation of what he's referring to. This is just before Jesus' ascension into heaven. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Remember, he had talked about the, the power that would be theirs in Luke chapter 24. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Jer Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the Holy Ghost in our life is power from on high. It is sent from God in doing his followers with power, power with intent. The power is for us to be witnesses, for us to be saints of God. But it's, it's very clear what the intent is here, that we are, we, we receive this power with God's intent that we would tell the story. It is power with purpose. So I, I do want to build on the word power just a little bit today. And I want to pose this as a question. Has this almighty God, who is all powerful, and uh, he's called this repeatedly, the word almighty that's used in reference to him means one that has to look to no other for assistance. Has this almighty God left behind a powerless religion to represent him. And I pose the question because I think that there are good people who have become unhappy with religion or unhappy in many instances with Christianity because it has no power, has had no power in their experience to help them deal with life. And uh, Paul warned of this, that there would be those who would have a form of godliness. He warned his, his uh, protege, Timothy, his son in ministry, there would be those who would have a form of godliness, and this is connected with, with false prophets. They would have a form of godliness, 
but they would deny the power thereof. So the answer to man's search for spiritual power is the Holy Ghost. Okay, again, any questions about the Holy Ghost as the power from God, feel free to ask or, or comment below. Okay, let's move to the last of the descriptive terms that we're going to talk about. John chapter 14 through John 16 is one of Jesus' longest recorded discourses. It is the longest recorded discourse that he has specifically with his closest followers. And it is the final conversation that he had with his disciples before he is going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He follows this this uh, discourse that's represented in these three chapters. John 17 is Jesus praying for his followers there and then his prayer for all who would follow him. So he follows this discourse with some final actions. He follows it with a prayer and then he, he follows it uh, with his men going with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. So it kind of puts it in the context that he is, he is dealing with things he wants to make sure that they get locked into their mind. John is the last of the gospel writers. He has had time to reflect and think and remember what has been said, and he is inspired to share this event of what Jesus told his disciples. In this portion of scripture, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus teaches several things about the Holy Ghost. And one of the words is that Jesus returns to repeatedly gives an incredible picture of what the Holy Ghost is in each of our lives. Okay, let's pick up, and we're not going to read all of John 14, uh, 15, and 16, but if you read all three chapters, nothing will change in what you have heard me share with you today. So John chapter 14 and verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. And there's the word that Jesus uses over and over again in John 14, 15, and 16. Another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So the comforter is the spirit of truth. This is another of those phrases that let us know what the Holy Ghost is. It is the spirit of truth. If someone ever says to you that the Holy Spirit directed me to do something, and what they have declared is contrary to, to what the Bible says, something other than the Holy Ghost directed them to that behavior because the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth, okay? So this comforter, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. What does it mean that the world does not, what does it mean that the world does not see the Holy Ghost and the world does not know the Holy Ghost? Well, Jesus defined a spirit as being invisible, and he gives explanation in the following phrase. He says, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Jesus was dwelling among them presently. He was with them at that moment. He would be in them later. Notice what Jesus uses. He uses a past tense, shall be. He was not describing what they already had. He had blown on them earlier and said, receive you the Spirit. But he is referring to something that they are going to receive. This is something that will happen to them. Shall. Shall. It is a future tense word. So he explains what he's talking about in this sense of knowing. So, He's put it in this perspective that uh, we're going to receive what was with them then, the Lord Jesus Christ, what was going to be in them, the Holy Ghost, that is called the Spirit of Christ in the book of Romans. So the comforter 
in verse 16. Let's talk about what it means to have the Holy Ghost in your life as a comforter. It is a, a Greek word. The Greek word is paraclete, and it refers to a helper or one uh, who comes alongside to help. That's a, a better definition. Let me try to portray it for you. Imagine that you are in a boat that is distressed. Uh, the engine has stopped working, or perhaps the plug has come out of the bottom of the boat and there's water that's just kind of coming up in and you're bailing or you're doing everything that you can. So you're there and you are in something of a bind. Someone across the lake in another boat notices you desperately bailing water, you jumping up and down, waving your arms, trying to get attention because you have a failed motor. And so those people who see you, they start the motor on their boat and they pull their boat alongside you and ask what they can do to help. Maybe they have a plug to, uh, to fill the hole or they tie a rope to your boat and pull you to the dock. Those who come to your rescue are those who have come alongside to help. They are your comforter. They are your paraclete. So when we look at all of these verses that are going to speak of the Holy Ghost as a comforter, always visualize the boat coming alongside your boat to help. The Holy Ghost is the comforter who comes alongside your life to help you. Now notice what Jesus said in verse 16. He said, I'm going to send another comforter. Another comforter. What does that mean? Well, in the next verse that we're going to read, Jesus tells what that comforter will be. Move down to John chapter 14 and verse 26. He's talking still about the comforter. But with the comforter, which is... Somebody ought to type it in down below the screen. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. So now we know what this paraclete is, what it is that comes alongside to hell. Jesus clarified it. It is the Holy Ghost. What's it going to do in our lives? He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the one who comes alongside to help is the Holy Ghost. It's sent in Jesus' name. And what does it do? It teaches and brings to remembrance what Jesus had said. So the Holy Ghost becomes a teacher in our life. Can any of us correctly know Christian life and Christian living without being taught? Well, obviously we have pastors slash teachers who are going to guide us into many things, but the Holy Ghost is a teacher. Holy Ghost is a teacher. The Holy Ghost quickens truths to our life that we need to apply. Okay, let's continue this conversation. John chapter 15 and verse 26 but when, there it is again, future tense, not now, but when. Yes, the Holy Ghost, this invisible manifestation of God working among humanity, had been a participant in the Old Testament. Jesus is talking of that same spirit becoming part of the activity of his people on a continual, ongoing basis. The apostle will write to one church and he would declare to them, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. So Jesus is talking about something that is going to be a constant, not an occasional visit, but it was to be a constant. Okay, but when future tense, the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which 
proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, I want you to notice how that in this discourse of these three chapters, the Lord reused words and phrases. The meaning of those words and phrases does not change within the framework of these three chapters. He is always promoting or expressing exactly the same thing. Number one, there's a comforter, one who comes alongside to help. Secondly, whom I will send unto you. And thirdly, it is the spirit of truth. So in this particular verse, 26 of chapter 15 of John, he gives an interesting phrase. He says, which proceedeth from the Father. The Greek dictionary says that if something proceeds, it comes out of. So the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth, it's the spirit of Christ, and it comes out of the Father. The Comforter comes out of the Father, will testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is going to bear witness of the Lord Jesus Christ in the lives of those followers and in the lives of you and I today. What an incredible thing it is to have this that comes alongside to help. Think about how many times Jesus did exactly that. When he saw the multitude that had followed him, that they were hungry, and he recognized or realized they didn't have food with them, he was moved with compassion toward them, and in his action, he came alongside to help. When the widow of Nain, they were taking her son to be buried outside the city. When Jesus saw the burial procession, he stopped the procession, and he spoke to the child, and the child was raised from death. Jesus came alongside to help. It's something as simple as the wedding of Cana, where they had ran out of wine. Jesus came alongside to help. That's what the Holy Ghost does for you and for me, if we have the Holy Ghost. It comes alongside to help, whether we're without, whether we are going through great distress as the widow of Nain, or whether there is the uncertainty of hunger that lies ahead of us. The Holy Ghost comes alongside to help. That's an amazing thing. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Christ that comes out of the Father and into us. Okay, let's look at another passage. John chapter 16, verse 7 through 13. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient. The word expedient means good. It is good for you that I go away. Now, if I had been one of Jesus' intimate followers, this would have been hard for me to understand. And his disciples did not understand because all you have to do is, is read everything that happened right after Jesus' crucifixion, recognize that Jesus said a lot of things that the disciples did not have a clue as to what he was trying to convey to them. So it's clear, it's sure, it's certain that this business of it's expedient for you that I go away, they don't understand that. Particularly when they see him as the Messiah who is going to restore the nation of Israel to its place of prominence in humanity. Nonetheless, he said, it's good for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. What is that comforter? I remind you, it's that which comes alongside the help that Jesus talked about. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth coming out of the Father. It's good for you, Jesus said, if I go away. Because if I don't go away, this comforter, the Holy Ghost, can't come, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will 
send him unto you. Now, I'm not talking about the nature of God in this particular lesson, but there's some things that you just can't hardly pass by. Earlier in uh, chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus said that the Holy Ghost proceedeth from the Father, and now Jesus is saying, I will send him unto you. Is it not another indicator that Jesus Christ is both Father and Son? Enough of that topic for today. And when he has come, when who's come? When the Holy Ghost has come, he will reprove. The word means convict. He's going to convict the world of sin. And it's interesting to me, and I never noticed this till I was studying just this morning. The Holy Ghost convicts of three things. It convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The word righteousness means right living, or it has been translated justice and judgment is obvious. And then Jesus gives explanation of what this means of sin. It convicts of sin because they believe not on me. So Jesus said, those who do not believe on him, and believing on him is not just believing that he exists, but it is taking the right behavior and taking the right steps that are actions of faith. He said, it's going to convict of sin because you believe not on me. It's going to convict of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In essence, I'm not going to be here to convict about right living. Just recently, it had to give Simon Peter good rebuking. He even told Peter, you're of your father, the devil. He's not going to be there to do any of, of that uh, reproving. And then of of judgment, of judgment, because that there's going to come judgment on the prince of the world, and if there's going to be judgment on the prince of the world, then there's going to be judgment on all of us as well. So there is a certainty of judgment. Do you notice the three points of conviction that the Holy Ghost is intended to bring I have seen incredible church services where that I had kind of preached and people stood and they watched. And then there have been the times when, and, and if you're not familiar with Pentecost, this may not be something you relate to, and I would encourage you to experience a Pentecostal church service or two or five or a dozen. But there are times when there's a divine interruption and I have watched in an atmosphere of worship where that the Holy Ghost is working and moving that people were convicted who had never been convicted by my preaching, no matter how good somebody else may thought it had been, because the Holy Ghost is a convictor of sin. It convicts us of the need to live right, and it convicts us of the reality that judgment is going to come. Jesus said, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, remember Jesus' conversation with the disciples, what is the spirit of truth? Somebody ought to just type it in below. When that spirit of truth has come, he will guide. So this is another thing that the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, the comforter, the spirit that proceeds out of the Father, this is another of those things that it does. It guides you into all truth. How can we know if something is truth without the Holy Ghost being our guide? He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Things that Jesus did not say. His followers are not ready to hear them. But the Spirit of God would inspire Paul, Peter, John, James and Jude to write. And these things have to do with proper Christian living as well as things to come. Now, it's important if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, it's important that you don't get the cart ahead of the horse. People who do not have the Holy Ghost cannot understand or apply the principles of Christian life. That's why that people who are churchmen and churchwomen basically take scissors 
or a magic marker to things that the Holy Ghost inspired these men to write and decide that they're irrelevant. Has the Holy Ghost guided them to determine what's relevant or irrelevant? Well, I personally, I don't think so. So the verses in John 14 through 16 say that the Holy Ghost is the comforter, the spirit of truth, it's a guide, it's a testifier, and a reprover. Remember what the comforter denotes. It is one who comes alongside to help. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside to help deal with life's challenges. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, and I'm talking to some today who do not have the Holy Ghost. Some perhaps do not know whether there be any Holy Ghost. You didn't know that you could have the Holy Ghost. If you're in that setting, I, I, I would appeal to you. Why don't you just kneel when we're done and say to the Lord, God, if that Holy Ghost that preacher has talked about, if that's for me, I really want you to guide me. I'd like for you today to fill me, but if you don't fill me today, with the Holy Ghost, I'd like for you to guide me. What's the significance of this? Well, receiving the Holy Ghost is receiving the Spirit of Christ. Receiving the Holy Ghost is a new birth. Receiving the Holy Ghost places a seal of Jesus' ownership on your life. Receiving the Holy Ghost is God giving you the down payment, the beginning of your eternal inheritance. Receiving the Holy Ghost marks your adoption into the family of God. Receiving the Holy Ghost provides you power to be an effective witness. Receiving the Holy Ghost means that you have a paraclete, one who comes alongside to help when your own boat is sinking. Receiving the Holy Ghost means that you have received the spirit of truth. Receiving the Holy Ghost means that you have received the spirit sent out by the Father. Receiving the Holy Ghost means that you have something in you better than the physical Jesus living in the house next door. Why would someone say, oh, I don't, I don't want that? Forgive me, Pastor. I, I, I understand what you've taught. I, I don't want any of that. I don't want that Holy Ghost. Well, I, I would not understand that response. And I don't imagine that there are any of such responses today. I do believe that the understanding of the significance of the Holy Ghost is what prompted Paul to ask those 12 in Ephesians and Acts chapter 19, verse 1, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It prompted them. Not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. It prompted them to be rebaptized, and they received the Holy Ghost. I would trust that that would be the outcome for you today, is that you would want to receive the Holy Ghost. If you've not yet received the Holy Ghost, if we follow all that I've taught you over the last few weeks, if you'll hear that Jesus Christ is the, Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is God manifest in flesh for the purpose of redeeming humanity, and that includes you. If you will believe that all of the benefits of the Messiah that were originally ascribed to be given to the Hebrews is given and made available to you. If you'll believe that Jesus will save you, it begins with that faith. That faith leads us not simply to do like Satan and say, well, I love God. It leads us to repentance. It causes the person who keeps the refrigerator full of booze, it 
it causes that person to repent and do an about face. It causes the person who keeps a little bit of um, recreational pot buried around the house somewhere. It 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 causes that person to say, you know what, I don't I don't need this in my that's called repentance. That's an about face in the direction that you've lived your life. About face. It's a turnaround. Okay, when we make that turnaround, we make that turnaround. Repentance. God, I'm sorry. I don't want to live that way anymore. Then we ask God, Lord, I'd like for you to wash my sins clean. And in every place that this happened in the scripture, there is the washing away of sin. There is the remission of sins that happens in baptism by immersion in water in the name of Jesus Christ. This accomplishes something that nothing else. Because in this, you're robed in Christ. In, in this, there's a burial of the old man. And then the promise is, and by the way, if you've not yet been baptized and would like to be, if you'll talk with us, we can find baptistry. We have lakes with cold water right now. We can find a place to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, as we have others since our church has been closed. Baptize you in the name of Jesus. But the promise is that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Would you like to have the Holy Ghost? If you'd like to have the Holy Ghost with God, there is no respect of persons. You're not excluded. You say, well, I'm not educated enough. That doesn't matter. You say, well, I'm not the right racial heritage. Doesn't matter. I don't speak the right language as my primary language. I don't have the right money. I don't have, just forget the all I don't have. With God, there is no respect of persons. You can have the Holy Ghost, this comforter which comes alongside to help. If you'd like to have the Holy Ghost today, if you'll enter into that prayer I talked about, this is not a prayer of salvation. It's simply a prayer of appeal. If you'll make that appeal to God, I know that God answers prayer. I know that there are people all around the world who in their personal prayer with not one other person in the room except just themselves and God. God has filled them. God has come into their life with the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me pray for you today and... Uh, just getting ahead of it tomorrow, we'll begin talking about Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets who spoke about the coming of the Holy Ghost because we need to make sure that what we've talked about has the right foundation previously in Scripture. Jesus, I thank you today for the people who are in the audience. God, there's so many names that have scrolled across the screen, I don't know. But God, I know each of them, and you know what their situation is, and you know what's going on in their lives. And I'm appealing to you on this Monday morning that something about this word concerning the Holy Ghost, that it would reach into their world and it would convict them. The Holy Ghost convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. God, let that stir us. Let us be a one. Let the Holy Ghost do a work that no matter how eloquent I could ever become or how much I might know or any of our capabilities, God, let it be that, that something stirs and moves and, and awakens in some lives today. God, as we go through this viral infection that is sweeping the world with such tragic consequences, I pray your protection over God's people. I pray your protection over this audience. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, give a great, great end time revival. We look for it before you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. It's good to be with you today. And look forward to seeing you in the morning at uh, 10 o'clock. By the way, go ahead and share. Even, after, even if you just came on, you can start a, uh, a, uh, uh, a group to view, and um, you can invite your friends to that. Start it from the first. That's one of the beauties of this. Uh, we're also on YouTube with all of this, so 
take a look. Invite your friends to take a look. And if you have friends who are really going through it right now, this is what they need. So give it to them. God bless. Love you.